Welcome to the DNA STAR Automated Bacterial Genome Closure Webinar. My name is Katie Maxfield, and I'm here with Matt Kaiser. Matt is a next-gen application scientist here at DNA STAR, and he's going to be going through what is a pretty new workflow in our software, um, showing multiple steps uh, how to uh, first select a closely related reference genome and then use that reference genome as a guide to assemble a bacterial genome. You'll notice that your phone or headset has been muted. However, we would like you to ask questions. To do this, just type them into the chat dialog, which you should see in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and send those questions to host. That's me. And then I'll pose these questions to Matt throughout the webinar to answer for the entire group. And if we don't get to any of your questions today, we will follow up with you after the webinar. So please ask uh, any questions that you have, and, and we'll get to as many as possible. And if you have any logistical questions about WebEx or the uh, webinar setup, you can send those to me as well. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it over to Matt. Thank you, Katie. Um, I'll make my desktop visible here. Okay, great. Um, so thanks again for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, I do recognize quite a few of you on the webinar today, um, so I know we've been in recent communication. And so hopefully uh, today we can go through the workflow in detail and uh, I can answer many of your questions uh, that you have about this uh, uh, new and, and really a, an exciting workflow for, for many folks that are working with uh, bacterial genomes. Um, so I, I will give just a little uh, background to our company. For, for those of you that are new to us. And we'll also go through some slides where I can show the workflow in detail and give some explanations. And then we'll also go into the software, of course. We'll set up an assembly, and then we'll look at some of the analysis tools in SeekMan Pro. So uh, DNA Star is a company located in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, of course, it doesn't look like this right now. It's a little bit colder here now. Um, but uh, we, we are located uh, uh, not too far from campus. Uh, we have our salespeople and our development team and scientific staff uh, located uh, in Madison. Um, and, and that really means that we can support our software well. So if, uh, for instance, if you're working on a, on a genome and you, know, you run into something that's difficult to resolve, um, you know, I can help you, and if, if it's something that I can't resolve, we have scientists here that uh, can take a look at the project and provide additional troubleshooting. So it's really nice to have everybody centrally located. Um, our history goes back quite a ways. Our, our founder is Dr. Frederick Blattner. Uh, he was the first to sequence E. coli K12 back in the 1990s. Um, and uh, the science paper from 1997 um, has a number of authors, some of whom are still contributors or uh, employees at DNA Star. Guy Plunkett, for instance, does a lot of our genome services with respect to assembly and annotation of microbial genomes. And, and, and Guy had a lot of input on the workflow that we're going to look at today. So we've basically taken this uh, a workflow that was completely manual um, over the past you know, 20 years, essentially, and automated it so that you know customers or users that are not maybe not experts that haven't closed genomes before can use our tools and 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 have success with a lot less effort than it than it took uh, years ago. And so our software has really been um, you know one of the leading softwares for you know many years all the way back to the 1980s, and we've really focused on software that is accessible to you know regular life scientists or molecular biologists. And we have very powerful assembly software. And then we provide the best possible analysis tools so that you can visualize the assemblies and do the type of analyses or things like gap closure steps you know, with, with a nice, uh, uh, easy-to-use program. Um, our software um, is research-grade software. And so you know, we just, I just have a chart here that shows the number of publications back all the way to 1985. And we are the most cited bioinformatics software you know, amongst our competitors. So our desktop software is, is powerful and easy to use. So for, for NextGen, um, our software is uh, um, agnostic. We can assemble Illumina and Ion Torrent and uh, 454 and pack biodata. Uh, the assembly component, SeekMan Engine, is 64-bit. It runs on Mac, PC, and Linux. Uh, we have some analysis tools that we're going to look at in SeekMan Pro today, um, but we also have analysis tools in ArrayStar for some of our other workflows. And the capacity is, is tremendous. Uh, we can analyze multiple genomes 
at once. We can assemble them at once or align them to a reference sequence. Um, we can do analysis at very, very large scales if needed. And the cost is low. Uh, it's under $5,000, and it gets, gets you both the assembly and analysis software. And of course, what really uh, distinguishes DNA Star from open source or other commercial competitors is the level of support that's provided with your purchase. And so we do webinars like this, uh, you know, on a, on a schedule, you know, once a month roughly, or once every couple of months. Um, I also do webinars individually with customers on a daily basis. And so if you're interested in purchasing our software, I'll do a webinar to go through your workflow so you're absolutely certain the software will meet all of your needs. Once you purchase the software, we'll do webinars to provide technical support. And that's a level of support that um, I don't think anyone, anyone else can match. So one of the first questions that will come up uh, with respect to desktop software um, is how powerful is it? You know, is it powerful enough to handle the type of um, uh, products that I'm doing. And so this is a table from our website. Um, it just shows you some of the um, reference guided assembly times that we have for different data sets, just to give you an idea of, of what kind of speed we have. And human genomes, which have you know over 3 billion Illumina reads, this is almost 40x coverage, takes under 24 hours. And on newer machines, we're going to have some new benchmarks now where this we can shave another 10 hours off of this time. Um, exomes, a couple hours a piece. When you do smaller things like E. coli genomes or smaller eukaryotes, you know, it's measured in minutes. So it's you know, a very, very fast um, assembler for all different types of projects. We also have a de novo assembly engine. And the de novo assemblies, um, usually the metric that we're going to use here is, is accuracy more than anything. Uh, but most folks like to use things like Contig N50. You know, how big are my Contigs? And there's half of my data or most of my data uh, um, contained in large Contigs. So Contig N50 is a good measuring barometer, but really it's the accuracy of these Contigs. I don't care if they're big, if they're inaccurate. I'd rather have a little bit smaller Contigs that are more accurate. And, and that's really where our assembler falls in is it's a very stringent and very accurate assembly. We have the intention or, or you know, we assume that researchers are going to use these Contigs to try to build genomes. Or if it's a transcriptome, they want to detect ORFs and translate the most accurate you know, protein sequences that, that are possible. And so other assemblers might show bigger Contig N50s. Um, we have big Contig N50s but also can meet accuracy needs. And so the workflow that we're looking at today actually combines both of these assemblers, so both of these tables. It's, it's really kind of a hybrid assembly of reference-guided with some de novo assembly. So both of these algorithms kick into gear. It's automated under the hood, so you don't have to see or, or manipulate each piece, um, but, but it is there. So the workflows that we support are pretty wide-ranging. So if your lab, if you do bacterial genomes, but you also do other workflows, um, our software and the algorithms that we use are flexible enough to accommodate all these different workflows. That includes genome and exome resequencing, RNA-seq, uh, de novo transcriptome, de novo genome, and of course what we're looking at today is the automated bacterial genome closure, which is a new workflow that we added this fall. Um, and we had, we had another minor release uh, this week that makes some more improvements to this workflow, and there will be more improvements over the next few months. So to, to, I think a good starting point for this particular workflow is probably the most common question that we'll get from customers who have just sequenced a new genome and they're wondering, you know, what's the best approach to, you know, assembling the genome and then closing as much of it as possible. And so, so the question that you have to answer is, should I take a de novo approach um, or should I use a reference genome to guide the assembly um, it, it, you know, of my newly sequenced strain. And really the answer to that is do both in our software. It's very fast. Within a couple of hours, you'll be able to answer most of those questions. Uh, the de novo approach, of course, is when we're going to assemble reads, cluster them, them together into contigs. Um, if, if, if we want to put a genome together, we have to have pair data, and we use the pair data to build scaffolds to put the contigs in the proper order, right? And um, all the good de novo assemblers like Seekman Engine will assemble all the novel areas of the genome, try to resolve some of the repetitive areas, but in areas where a read cannot be uniquely placed, if it's you know if you have an IS element in E. coli, for instance, uh, that read might match 50 different places in the de novo layout. And so to avoid falsely joining contigs at these repeats, um, a gap is left there. And then you use the mate pair data 
to order the contigs around the gap. So and that's a typical de novo approach. Um, for microbes, the best de novo assemblies um, will yield between, you know, at the, at the high end, or I should say at the best end, 25 contigs um, and, and to about 100 contigs. And that's the number of contigs that you would need to reach your genome length. So if you've got a genome that's not very repetitive and you've got nice long reads and mate pair data, you might be able to get something as good as 25. And that means you have 25 gaps that you would have to resolve manually, figure out it might be directed sequencing. You may use BLAST to try to figure out what the pieces are that are causing the gaps. Um, but you'd have to do 25 um, gap closure steps. Um, for most people, with the, mo you know, the most data that, that, that you're using for most genomes, it's going to be closer to that 100 contig range. Um, and if you've got a really repetitive genome, and maybe if your data isn't really good, you could have more than 100. So de novo assemblies um, can be very, very time consuming. Each gap may take one or more hours to resolve to a high degree of confidence. So you can just kind of do the math and see, you know, if I've got a really novel genome that's highly repetitive, we're looking at a very, very big project and very time consuming to close all the gaps. So that's why reference sequences are um, um, interesting to us. You know, if we have an, a reference sequence that's close to my sequence strain, um, I'm able to guide the assembly and, and end up with, with a project that has fewer gaps than what I get with my de novo assembly. And so that's the goal. Now, the old approach for reference guided assembly is, you know, aligning to the reference and then uh, manually scanning through the assembly to find areas where there's no coverage or areas where there's some obvious uh, rearrangement or structural variant, and then manually splitting the reference sequence um, and manually ordering everything into scaffolds and then figuring out what are deletions, what are insertions, where the inversions are, that sort of thing. So if your strain is really close, you may only have you know, a couple structural variants to resolve, and with the old approach, it was better than de novo assembly. However, it, most reference strains have more than just a couple of structural variants. You know, you may have a few dozen or a hundred structural variations. And if you manually resolve those, the amount of work uh, compared to de novo assembly, it's roughly equivalent. You still have manual gaps to close. And so this is where our new uh, uh, workflow comes in, where we automate some of these more labor-intensive steps. We the algorithms are new that identify where the structural variants are occurring, and it's going to use uh, you know, depth of coverage. It's going to use some other phenotypes of the alignment. It's going to use paired end information. Um, and it's going to automatically find these areas. It's going to break apart the reference sequence here, and it's going to de novo assemble, make contigs in areas where there's insertions, and it's going to merge deletion regions together. And so these close genomes contain, you know, you know what I'm saying close, you know, a hundred or less structural variants. And if you look at the SNP level, it may be a couple of thousand SNPs um, difference. And so that's kind of a broad rule of thumb for, you know, how close should this reference genome be? If I had 300 structural variants, um, the workflow will still work. Um, however, you'd want to look at your de novo assembly and see with, if I have 300 structural variants, does my de novo assembly actually get me closer in terms of number of contigs and gaps than using my reference sequence? So that's kind of the, the decision process. This is something that we can help you with. You know, so if you have a sequence strain and you're not sure which one to use, that's where our technical support comes in. You know, I can take a look at it. Um, I can have some of the scientists here take a look and, and give you some advice on which route to, to, to go. So, so how do you find, so, so assuming that you um, want to try the reference uh, approach, um, one of the first things that you need to do is find the suitable reference genome. In many cases, you know what it is. If it's a derivative of E. coli K12, you know that you can use one of the K12 strains. In other cases, it's not so easy. You may not know what the best reference genome is, or if it exists, you might have to search and find one. Um, so we do have some tools that allows us to actually try to locate the best possible reference genome. And we use our SeqMan engine assembler to align our sequence data to an entire microbial genome database. So we can sort the reads to, you know, it can be 1,000 or 5,000 microbial genomes. And by, by looking at where the reads map and the type of coverage that we get, we can determine, you know, what the best reference sequence is. Uh, and then, of course, we can compare that then to our de novo assembly to see, you know, is our de novo assembly the best approach? Or, again, 
the, the reference sequence that we identified. And it's also possible that we might need more than one reference genome. Um, there may be genes on one strain but not the other, um, so you may pick a couple of different reference genomes. That's actually an area that we're going to work on in the future to make that a more automated process of finding the best reference genome or genomes um, to start your automated workflow with. So I'll actually show you. I'm going to jump out of the PowerPoint here just to show you, you know, what that looks like. And so I'm launching Seekman Engine, and let's go back one page. So uh, Seekman Engine, again, is our 64-bit program, um, and it's used for the de novo and reference-guided assemblies. And the output from Seekman Engine will analyze in Seekman Pro. This is really a, pro uh, a program is really a wizard. Um, you, you see it doesn't have a file open menu or you know, an edit menu. Um, it's, it's meant to allow you to set up your project and to be as easy to use as possible and also flexible to accommodate um, all the different kind of workflows that, that people are doing. So typically we'll start with a new assembly project. Um, we might also start by loading a script file in, and we'll look at script files at the end of the wizard. Um, so if I, I load a script file if I want to run the same assembly that I ran, say, a month ago, and I change some parameters. Um, I can rerun that assembly by loading the script in, and it will pre-populate um, from the script this, this wizard. But we'll just uh, create a new assembly project. And for this genome picking workflow to find our reference genome, we're going to pick a metagenomic or population assembly. And then the assembly type, uh, with our metagenomic assembler, we can do both templated and de novo. Excuse me, of course, de novo is a completely different workflow from metagenomics. Um, in this case, we, are gonna, we want to sort our sequence data to a large number of templates. And I already named this. It's going to be our microbial genome picker. And we pick an output folder and then a temporary file location. Uh, the temporary file location is an indication of how, how the hardware is used. And this link will take us to our website that gives us technical requirements for this assembler. Um, and if we, when we're doing large-scale templated assemblies, uh, we need adequate disk space to process all the, as we break down the templates into smaller units and the query data, uh, that gets written to disk, in addition to using RAM and CPU. Uh, for the really big projects, we may need several terabytes of space. So, for example, a human genome assembly where the human genome is 3 billion uh, base pairs long, um, we might need 6 to 8 terabytes of this scratch disk space uh, to process all of that data. For um, bacterial genome databases, those can be pretty big as well. And in fact, the temporary MER file that's created from a database of 4,000 genomes is, uh, can be larger than a human genome. And so if you're doing this sort of workflow, you'll need to be cognizant of how many bacterial genomes you're aligning to, and you may need you know, a terabyte or a couple terabytes of space to do this sort of sorting. The template file, uh, in this case, I'm going to pick a, a folder that is a microbial genome database, and we'll just take a look at that. Um, this is one that... Uh, we downloaded uh, the NCBI has, they're sometimes kind of hard to find, um, but you, if you search around the FTP site at NCBI, you'll see that there's different folders that can be downloaded that contain, um, in this case, an alphabetical um, grouping of bacterial genomes. And if we look inside using Universal Viewer, it's a big file, but uh, maybe I'll try a smaller one. Oh, there we go. So here's uh, all the microbial genomes you know, that start with a letter A, essentially. And we can see the species name at the top. And so this is one of the databases that we've used. And it's an alphabetical sort. There are other databases that use, of course, accession numbers, or they might use their own um, nomenclature for naming the sequences. And as long as they're in FASTA format or GenBank format, and we can group them together in a folder, we can align to them. And so how you structure the FASTA files you know, impacts what we see in the downstream analysis a bit. So in, in sometimes you have to pull out the pieces of information that you need. But there's multiple different databases that, are, that, that can be used here. So I'm going to use the entire, I can use the entire database, 
or I can pick a subfolder, or I may have a group of phylogenetic kind of grouping or, or, or typing of my bacterial strains. Um, so I might just group those strains that I think my strain is related to to make the project smaller. I'm going to add in sequence files. Uh, you can see that at this point in the wizard, we can pick uh, the different platforms. And really, when we, when we pick the platform, that's when we really start to set the optimal uh, uh, assembly parameters for that particular data type. So ion torrent data requires different parameters than Illumina. Uh, 454 requires different parameters than Illumina or ion torrent as well. And so we tell it what platform we have. We can load up data, so I can pick paired end data. Uh, this is some GA2 data that's in a text format. These are Illumina FASTQ files. Um, so we'll load FASTQ or, um, uh, or SFF files. And now we um, pick the assembly options. We'll see here that uh, we can do a couple of different things. Um, we're aligning to a, a microbial genome database, and so I don't want a lot of mismatched hits. I'm going to have a lot of sequences in that database that are almost identical, especially if it's E. coli. And so I can make my assembly stringent so that my reads are forced to align just to the strain that they're most closely related to. And so I can adjust parameters here. Um, and with metagenomic or these kind of sorts, um, these are the kind of assemblies where we will fiddle with parameters and try multiple assemblies to get the best outcome. So for example, I can say, let's make this more stringent. I want my reads to match 95% in order to align to one of the templates. I can go to the advanced options under um, layout options, and we can see with a, with a metagenomic or multiple genome alignment, if a read maps to more than one template, which many will, um, we want to place all of them. We're not, it's not a genome alignment where we're trying to force a read to align to the best possible match. And we expect that reads will match to many templates equally well. Um, this version of the algorithm allows it to do that. We can also change some more knobs and dials here to make it more stringent or less stringent. Um, I might say if my read lengths are 100, the minimum align length must be 75. Again, I don't want it to be trimmed back too far. I want a more stringent assembly. So these are just some adjustments. And again, we can help you with these as we assemble as you uh, um, try to uh, use this workflow. Uh, and then the project's ready to begin. You'll see here that we have a, um, a script here. Um, and this script is the text file that's written um, when we use this wizard. So the script is saved out automatically. It's great for technical support. You can email it to DNA Star, to myself. Uh, you know, we can help troubleshoot you know, looking at your script. And then when, when we click Assemble, um, there will be a log file as well. So that's how we set up this metagenomic sorter. And let me just show you what the output project looks like. Matt, uh, before you get into SeekMan, uh, we do have a couple questions. Um, one is, um, for the genome closure workflow, do you have to use a complete genome as a reference, or is it possible to use contigs from a previous assembly as reference sequences? Um, it's, it, you know, it's, it's preferable to use a, a completed genome, obviously, if, if, if you have it. Um, you could also use contigs. Um, there's, there, there's, you know, so we can handle multiple templates. Um, the only issue is that uh, that workflow will not join those con the contigs together any further. You'd still need to, um, so, so what I might do to, in that case, is I might make a, uh, a concatenated sequence with the contigs if they're ordered in a scaffold and provide engine with a concatenated scaffolded sequence rather than you know a file of contigs great and then uh, one other question going back to something you mentioned in the powerpoint um you said a closely related genome would have about a few thousand snip level differences is that a hard limit in the software or is it possible to have more uh, snip level differences um, yeah, yeah. The SNPs can be so. The SNPs really don't have much of an impact on the workflow. So, and that can be highly variable. It can be hundreds. It can be thousands of SNPs. It's the structural variants that really make the difference. If your strains have a lot of structural variations, larger insertions and deletions, you know that's really what determines the success or failure of the workflow. And, and so that's kind of a rule of thumb: 
is that you know now if I had a million SNPs or hundreds of thousands, that's going to suggest that the strains aren't very close, and you probably also have a lot of structural variants. But if you if you have a, a situation where there's a lot of SNP differences but not a lot of structural variants, that would still be a great candidate for this workflow. Great, thank you. Okay, so here is uh, the, the, the SeekMan, uh, the metagenomic sorting assembly. Um, and of course, when we open SeekMan, we get a couple of windows, and one of them is the project uh, report. And the project report gives us the statistics for the assembly. And we can see here that um, a lot of, I won't go through all these, but we can see that we've got, in this particular sorting, 1,675 template genomes. And we have the number of sequences in my query, which is 4. I think that's 4.5, or no, excuse me, 45 million query sequences. So that, that's what I align to the genomes. And if I look all the way down here, the export align count, this is the number of sequences that were actually aligned and exported in the BAM format. And you can see that that's 708 million sequences. So that's because we uh, this algorithm allows a read to be placed more than one time. So you can see that there's a lot of redundancy with this particular um, set of reference sequences. So you know I have many more sequences that are exported in my BAM format. Um, so this report file, again, is a great troubleshooting uh, tool. You can send this as a text file through email. It gives the output as well as the script file that was used for uh, that assembly. And so now what I, I get is a window of contigs. And for this assembly, I sorted by um, number of sequences. So I can see that for some of these uh, reference sequences, and there's a du duplicate in there, I can see that I, I get you know 41 million. Almost all of my reads align to uh, the top couple of strains. And if I scroll down, you can see that for the other strains, we have a smaller number of reads aligning. And so I can look at my alignment. And you know we can look at SNPs. Actually, the SNPs I think were turned off on this particular assembly. But I can look at you know how closely these map, and I can also look at a strategy view. And the strategy view then will uh, give me kind of a genome browser type view, so I can see what the coverage looks like across the entire genome. And it takes us a little bit to build all the all the pair files up. Okay, I'll just I'll just come back to that. We can look at that view. There's also uh, a, a, another report that allows us to uh, look at the statistics for the assembly so I can see what the median coverage is across all the reference sequences. And, and so that kind of a table that we get is usually sufficient for um, you know, doing our analysis. And so, so that's kind of the, uh, the, the picker workflows. We just do the alignment and see where my reads align. Do I have a template? where I get the majority of reads aligning to that template. And once I do, I can pick that template then for the workflow. So I'll just jump back here to the PowerPoint. And I just want to kind of show an overview now of the automated genome workflow. So of course, we've seen the wizard here. We create a project. This will be genome assembly. We're going to pick reference guided assembly with gap closure. Um, the template file that we'll use is a um, MC1061 strain, and we're going to align K12MG165, two K12 strains. And I can load, again, Illuminar ion torrent data, FASTQ or SFF. Uh, we can pick, the um, um, again, the match percentages and genome ploidy. Okay, and then in the script, we get some new commands now. And these commands are specific to this workflow. And they're commands that allow us to split the reference sequence apart, to find sequences that fall into the insertion regions, and then to also assemble the leftover reads that do not map to the reference. So there's some new commands that are in this script. And when we look at the assembly then, and go into SeqMan, we can run a structural variation report. And and so this report is going to show us all the places in this alignment where there's either a deletion or an insertion or something that looks kind of like both, like an inversion. Um, and so this report is interactive. And we'll, we'll look at this in more detail. Um, but we can look at this report. And we can see the type. 
for insertions. We get a reference position. Uh, we get um, estimated pair distances and also uh, the features that, um, that are in that region. And so when I do this particular experiment between these two K-12 strains, there's, depending on the technology and how I set my parameters, there's going to be between about 30 and 35 structural variants detected in this table. Um, so that's the quickest way to figure out, you know, how different are my two strains. I can do a quick reference-guided assembly, and, and that'll just take, a, you know, a couple of minutes, and I can look at this table. If this table has, again, 500 structural variants, that's telling me that this, these strains are not very closely related. So I'm shooting for something, you know, under 100, you know, maybe 200, somewhere in that range um, to be optimal. And so the way that the, what the assembler is doing then is it, it uh, has a structural variation table, and it's going to use that information to break apart the reference sequence and try to remove that reference bias. And so insertion points are detected um, mostly via the trim points at the insertion site. So this is just a screenshot showing, you know, near this gene, uh, we have some reads that are aligned and they're trim back. These black triangles indicate trim points. And you can see upstream and downstream, and right at the insertion point, we have our reads that are trimmed back. And so that's a certain phenotype of the alignment that's indicating that there is, in my sequence strain, a novel sequence here. And we don't know how big it is. It could be 20 base pairs or 50 base pairs. It could be 20,000 base pairs in size. At this point, we just know that there's some event has occurred here, some insertion sequence. Um, we detect deletions in a different way. Um, deletions are detected uh, using, a, you know, there's more than one piece of evidence, but one thing can be the depth of coverage. We get a drop-off in coverage at the deletion point in many cases. Not always, but in many cases. Uh, we also get reads that map to either side of the deletion. So if I have a deletion in my sequence strain, um, that appears as if it's an insertion in the reference sequence. And so I get this, this area, these, these pink-colored reads in the SeqMan strategy view, where the reads map to either side of the deletion point. And so this is very, very strong evidence that, oh, we've got a deletion in this point. Now, sometimes uh, there's a deletion, but the reference sequence has an element. It might be a phage insertion. Um, and, and maybe your sequence strain has some phage in it. So sometimes you actually get coverage in these deletion areas. So they get messy looking, and they're not as clear cut. These split reads make it much more clear cut. You know that a deletion event occurred here. Uh, we can resolve these by clipping out. The algorithm will clip out the reference sequence and stitch together these split reads together, and that resolves the deletion. And so, you know, the goal of this workflow is to find a good reference genome, um, do your alignment, find the structural variants, and then um, have the algorithm then automatically go through and start to remove the bias of the reference sequence, split apart the reference sequence, merge deletion areas, and then look at the insertions and try to figure out what's in those insertion regions. And, and so de novo assembly in those areas, we can plug contigs in, we can have mate pair information fall into those insertion sequences and build contigs in those areas. And those contigs, if they get big enough, may actually fill up the insertion sequence and can be merged using additional algorithms in SeqMan. And of course, through the whole process, we maintain the order of the contigs. So we have scaffolds, and the scaffolds have a position information. It keeps the contigs in the proper order. Uh, and that's, that's critical for any uh, genome closure, um, as it's often repetitive elements in the gaps. And if you don't maintain order, it's very easy to get things, to use algorithms in the wrong way and merge uh, contigs that don't actually go together. So with this workflow, um, and, this, and I'll show, again, I'll show you this in more detail. Um, we automatically resolve 28 of the 31 structural variants between these two strains. And so if I look at an assembly then um, uh, that says, and I'll say the word aligned in it, .sqd, so that's the end assembly after these auto algorithms have been, have been run. And I'm looking at the project report here, and I just see a bunch of merging contigs. So these are algorithms built into SeqMan that look for overlaps, merge deletions, um, fill in insertion areas, merge contigs that overlap. And what we get then is a scaffold sequence now with four pieces. It has positional information. Uh, the length, and you can see this is almost three megabases, you know, 1.6 megabases. So almost the whole genome is, is present here. 
and now I just have, I went from 31 gaps that I had to manually close to four gaps that I manually close. So, and that takes an hour. So an hour's worth of, you know, just the assembler doing its thing just saved me, you know, however long it would take me to do 28 gaps. And that's, you know, pretty much at least a week's worth of work, a lot more for a lot of folks. So if we, and if we look at these remaining four um, structural variations, and just so, so what I've done here is we can look at the contigs and the position number, you know, 62, 372, and then go back to the structural variation report. Uh, we can see that at those positions, um, and what I have highlighted here, those are insertion sequences. So the areas that are still unresolved um, with this particular data set um, are larger insertions, things like ribosomal operons. Um, I think there's also a phage that was inserted. Um, and there just wasn't enough sequence data to autofill. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, with an ideal data set, one that has more pair data, say deeper pair data, um, projects like this can get closed completely and automatically. Um, data sets that are less ideal, uh, you might have, you know, instead of four, I could have 10 gaps that I have to close. So, so there's a range there in what your end result is going to be. And then, of course, we have some de novo. So, so there's some more reads now that still haven't gone into our new strain. Um, we don't throw those away. The algorithm hangs on to them and does an automated de novo assembly. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we have contigs now that are de novo assembled. And you can see these are some big contigs here. And these contigs then um, can be placed. We have another algorithm that will come in and say, do these contigs fit somewhere in these remaining gaps? And what used to be a manual process, the algorithm will go through and place contigs into gaps if they fit. So that's, that's kind of an overview of you know, this workflow. Let me, let me jump out here. and go back to, to, to SeekMan, uh, SeekMan engine. So, so now again, we pick Genome Assembly. And you'll notice this is different than my screenshot. So we had a, a, a new release, uh, an update earlier this week. And we added, there's actually a fourth workflow. So I have my, my templated normal workflows. Um, again, this can be used for human genome assemblies. We have our de novo workflow for genomes. We have our new workflow, reference guided assembly, with all the gap closure algorithms. Uh, and then we, we brought back an older workflow um, that has some very specific qualities uh, using the old, older algorithm. So for some of you existing customers that are listening today, um, this is the uh, pre-4.1 templated version. So it's a, a legacy workflow. And again, we'll just set the project up. Now we've you know, set our template, another K12 strain. Um, in this case, we're using Illumina data, paired end data. And I'm just going to stick with default options. Whereas with the metagenomic uh, workflow, I will often change many different parameters trying to get exactly what I want. We've run thousands of assemblies like this with Illumina data. I'm just going to stick with defaults, and it's ready to begin. And now the output from this workflow has a lot of different files in it. And the reason for that is that we want to be able to show each step in the process. Um, rather than just giving you something where everything is, have, has already been closed. And so the output here, um, is a number of different files. So it's a little, I don't have them organized terribly well here, I'm sorry about that, but I have the, uh, the first file that we'll look at, which is a BAM assembly file. So this is the data aligned to the reference, and it says no split in it. So this is the assembly where we haven't done anything. We've just taken the data and aligned it to the reference and haven't split or merged. Um, it's in a BAM format, so it's easy to open up. And so, so that's the unprocessed assembly. And so that's a nice starting point just to see what we're dealing with before we do any of the automated steps. Uh, then we have another uh, project that is going to be labeled uh, just dot .assembly um, in BAM format and also in our SQD editable format. And this is going to be where we've partially processed. So it's an intermediate project where we've partially processed and we've split the reference sequence apart, and we've added some of those small contigs that fill in insertion regions. So we can look at it kind of right in the middle. And then, of course, we have the project called Aligned. And this is after the algorithm has auto-aligned and merged um, the overlapping ends of the contig. So, so there's kind of three steps that we can look at. 
So it's really helpful. So that's what I'm going to show you now is the first one where we haven't done any splitting. Matt, uh, before you get into this next uh, application, we do have a couple questions. Sure. Um, one is, uh, I think you may have showed this in your slides, but have you used this workflow with ion torrent data? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so when we develop the workflow, is uh, ion torrent and Illumina data. Great. And then another question is, um, not to put you on the spot here, but do you have a rough idea of the the specs on the computer that you're using? Um, yeah. Well, this this particular computer is overkill for this workflow. So I use uh, a 16 gigabyte RAM, eight core, and I have eight terabytes of uh, free disk space for human genome projects. Um, for if you if you're looking for a computer, um, it, it really depends if you need to do the metagenomic sorting. If you think that you'll be searching for reference sequences, then you need the disk space. If you think you, that you know what your reference genomes are going to be without having to do the big sorts. You know, then uh, you know I would recommend a 16 gig RAM computer, four cores. You know, an i7 processor, or any of the Mac processors is going to be more than enough. So, it's fairly modest requirements. Great, thanks. So this is um, not the right one. Let me try that one more time here. Uh, aligned. I'm going the wrong way in my list here. Here, okay. So this is the no split assembly, and um, so there. So we haven't done any of the uh, any of the splitting at all. And so I can you know look at my assembly. There's one contig. It's in a scaffold, but there's no other contigs. And I can scroll along this reference sequence, and I can see my annotations on my reference by expanding that triangle. Um, these are my aligned reads. Um, SeqMan Engine is a true assembler. It's not a mapping algorithm. Um, so what that means is that we also generate a consensus sequence. Uh, mappers do not build consensus sequences. So we have a consensus that's present here as well. And let's see. I'm going to launch a structural variation report. And the structural variation report, um, you can see there's 33 variants here. And it's interactive, so I can go, here's the one that we looked at in the PowerPoint. I can double click on the report, and there's the insertion site. And so this is the, actually the screenshot that we looked at. Now, what we can also look at here is I can extend, just to take a peek at these reads. If I click on the read and then extend, um, you can see that all this part of the sequence was trimmed back. And this is actually the portion of the sequence that extends into the insertion sequence. And so we can extend, and we use this data. Um, once we split the reference, we can extend the ends on these sequences and reach into the insertion. If it's a small insertion, uh, this extension alone will close off the insertion. So those are fairly easy to resolve. If the insertion is much longer, of course, you know, then there's going to be a gap there of unknown sequence. <clears throat> and that's where, excuse me, that's where we put um, use some approaches like de novo contigs and see if they fit. Uh, and we also use pair information. So if I can anchor a pair here, right? so if I just go, let's go upstream here a little bit. So this particular read is right upstream of the insertion point. Its mate pair may well fall you know, in the insertion. So I can look up this particular read and see, OK, it falls somewhere in there. It's in my unassembled. It didn't match the template. It's in my unassembled bin somewhere, and I can take those reads and start to group them together and collect them. <clears throat> collect them. And in, if I get enough of those reads, um, I can get a contact that's big enough to resolve the entire insertion sequence. So that's the kind of, again, automated steps um, that, that we're doing here. And I'll just go back. And so this structural, structural variation table then um, allows me just to kind of take a look at the you know the different areas. So you'll see not all those insertions are that clean. So here's one where there's some toenailing that we call it. Uh, so we get some overlap, and we still identify it. And so sometimes there's some just some match you know at the flanking regions. So it's not quite as clear cut, uh, but we still find them. 
and the way that we design the algorithm is to err on the side of, uh, let's just split anything that looks like it could be an insertion. It doesn't add that much to the algorithm or the assembly time. And again, we can look at, you know, here's another one where it's not perfectly clean, but it's easily recognizable by all the endpoints. So that's so that's the unsplit assembly. You know, we can go here um, to see what does it look like before we, you know, start breaking things apart. Um, once we break things apart the, and start to fill in those insertion sequences, that's our next stage. And it's just the data. Again, we're looking at the BAM file, the dot assembly. And on this one, I remember to get our strategy view opened. They always open very slowly with webinar running. Um, and so if we look at our contig list, we see it's suddenly gotten a lot busier. And so what we have here is um, our reference sequence is now in a scaffold with multiple contigs in it. And these contigs, I'll just kind of expand here, we have contigs that have the reference name, and they are right now they're color coordinated, coordinated black, and these are the, the main pieces here. And you can see under the size that they're big chunks of our reference genome that are split up. And then the indented contigs that are colored blue that tend to be much shorter and many fewer reads aligning, these are the new contigs that we formed in the insertion regions. And so if we look at um, position information, you know, here's, if we, if we remember 2253 under, let's just go back to the structural variation report. So we can see 2264, we had an insertion. Here's our split. Our position information is at 2253. It's falling in the middle of that area. Our next insertion is at 62384. And we can see the positional information we have again, contigs forming in these insertion regions. And so we've split it apart. These blue contigs now are the contigs that we've uh, assembled in the insertion regions. Okay, and then if you look at a strategy view, you know, it sort of looks like this, where we've got um, our big contigs here. And you can see there's features from the reference genome. And here's another big chunk on this side. And then we have a little piece in the middle, a little pileup of reads. And these are reads that have fallen into the insertion area, into that gap. And so we can kind of navigate, you know, so I can double click and then go to that point in the strategy view. So here's another gap where I have my reference contig. Again, it's got all the annotations for my reference genome. And this is a little bit nicer example. So then we have the other piece here. And then here's the de novo form contig in the middle of this gap. And the color coordinations are, you know, green means we have deep sequences in both directions. These blue areas just mean that a number of reads that are, uh, they're mate pair placed reads that have, are pointing in the same direction. So you get this kind of alternating effect like that. So this is, again, the intermediate step. So, so it's nice that we save this. You can actually go in and look and see, you know, what, what's happened. You know, what, is it, what did the algorithm do up to this point? And now, of course, uh, it automatically looks for overlap between these small insertion contigs, merges the deletions, and will join these two contigs if there's overlap. And that is the uh, project that's labeled aligned. And the aligned project now um, you can see has a single scaffold. That single scaffold has got, in this case, we've got five pieces, five gaps that still need to be resolved. So this is what we open then when we do the workflow. So we've just got a, you know, a relatively small number of gaps um, to close compared to the number of structural variants that we, that, that we had with the project. Now there is another algorithm that we can add. So we still have these unlocated contigs. Right? And if I expand these, here's the unlocated contigs can sort by length, and we can see we, they're sizable. They're certainly real. We'll look at them, you know, and I'm going to look and see, you know, are these, you know, we got that little bit of a thin area. I might edit it. You know, I might say, well, I don't want that little tail. I'll just delete it. You know, I just want these deep areas. That's real data from my sequence strain. You know, that goes somewhere in this genome, all right? So you don't want to throw any of that out. And so I can look at a number of these contigs and say, well, yeah, these are all real pieces. They go somewhere. 
Um, so let's try to do something with them. Um, I might decide that the little ones aren't real. They're too thin or they're just stuff like, you know, repetitive areas like this. Or, you know, so I might delete some of the tiny contigs that I don't think have enough coverage to be real. Uh, and then there's another algorithm here that is called place unlocated contigs. And this will look for overlap between these de novo contigs and it'll look in the gaps in my scaffolds and look for overlaps on the ends of these contigs. It will also use pair information to try to match up orphaned mate pairs in these de novo contigs with mate pairs in the scaffold contigs. And so that's kind of the last thing that we can do automated to place the contigs in. And, and in this particular, it, it takes several minutes to run the algorithm. In this particular project, I believe it closes one more of these gaps off. And so, so those are all the automated steps. Then you get to the point where we're back to kind of the manual gap closure. That's a different webinar um, where we can show you know how to do that, um, you know, and, and perform those steps. And you know, and then at this point, um, you know, once you have things closed, you might decide that this is far enough. You don't need to close the whole genome. Having a handful of gaps on a scaffold, you know, that may be all you need to do. You know, then we have other um, steps. You know, we can do. Um, take features and copy them over from the reference sequence over to the consensus. So we can build a new consensus sequence. Now bringing annotations over, we can use BLAST um, all this to, to annotate as well. And so I can BLAST some novel contigs and collect features from my BLAST hits. So there's a couple of automated ways to pull in features you know, onto our new consensus strains. Um, we can export consensi out. So if, if you know, I can take my scaffold and I can go to contig, save the consensus, you know, out. So again, it's a true assembler. So we recompute the consensus based off of the aligned reads. So it will take account all the variations that you have. Um, we can also send consensus sequences over to um, programs like SeekBuilder, where we can look at annotations and have more elaborate GenBank style annotations. So it's you know it's, we have all the tools downstream then for closing off these gaps, you know, adding annotations, and then you know and then actually displaying. We can also uh, use you know our programs like our you know our GenVision, you know, to create a an image then to take feature tracks, to take GC plots from our software, and to create a publishable image, um, you know, of your genome. So I think uh, that's all I have today. So again, thanks again for your time. Um, any questions that folks have, uh, I'll be here for the next few minutes to answer any questions. Um, if I can't get to everybody, uh, you know, I'll, I'll contact you through email with answers to your questions. So thanks again. Thanks, Matt. We do have a couple questions here. Um, one is, do paired end reads work well for scaffolding, or do you have to have mate pair data? Um, it, it actually it, it doesn't matter to us. So uh, paired end is sufficient. So the Illumina data that we use for this workflow for the project that we're looking at now, that was Illumina paired end data, where the insert size was only you know less than 500 base pairs. Um, if you have mate pair data, um, that mate pair data has you know the potential to allow you to resolve larger insertions. So if you've got a higher degree of de novo assembly to do. Um, you might get some advantages with the mate pair data, but the algorithm works perfectly well with, with either. Great. And then another question, is it possible to find um, a mate pair read um, from one contig that the, the paired read is actually located in another contig or in an unassembled reads? Um, so, so there are, so the algorithm does that sort of tracking. So, um, you know, for instance, in this scaffold, if I have a mate pair that's, you know, on this particular contig, right, but it's, but it's or a, a paired end read, a forward read here, and the reverse is somewhere in one of the de novo contigs, that's what this algorithm will do automatically. It looks for those pairs that are on two different contigs, and if there's then sufficient overlap, you know, we can, um, well, if there's sufficient pair information, we can actually build a contig within the scaffold. If there's pair information and overlap, we can merge the de novo contig with the scaffolded reference guided contig. Great, thank you. It, it looks like we still have a, a lot of questions coming in, and that's great. Um, we will follow up with people afterwards. 
Um, but I do want to uh, mention a couple of administrative things before we sign off here. Um, one is that this webinar has been recorded and we'll post it on our website um, within the next couple of days. So I noticed some people coming in late, or if you missed any part of it, um, the whole recording with the uh, visuals and the audio will be on our website, and you'll get an email um, pointing you to that recording. And then the other aspect to that is we have more detailed videos that show three to four minutes of uh, smaller workflows. So pieces of the workflow that Matt showed you today, for example, uh, details on how to use the different views in Seekman Pro and how to use Seekman Engine. Uh, that's all on our website as well. And that's at dnastar.com forward slash videos. And you can also see all of our videos and webinar recordings on our YouTube channel. So uh, we're, we're happy to follow up with anyone uh, individually after the webinar, but uh, you can also get some of our training resources online as well. So with that, I think I'm going to um, end the webinar now. Uh, you're free. Uh, feel free to keep chatting in questions, and we can uh, follow up with you after the webinar. Thanks so much for joining us today.